About three years ago, in fact September 2015, my friend Sue got a phone call from her regional vice president based in Singapore saying, I'm going to be there next week, I'd like to spend some time with you. Imagine the thoughts going through Sue's mind. But let me give you a bit of background. Sue had been at this company for 18 months. She hadn't yet made quota, although she'd never sold before. She had a great sales manager and she was developing very well and she, she saw a future in sales. Unfortunately, that sales manager got killed in a car accident. A very sad thing, about two months prior to her getting that phone call. So you can imagine Sue's state of mind. Fast forward a week and in walks the regional vice president and says to Sue, you've had a tough time, we know. We know you've got the background. Sue had studied cyber security in, uh, at university. She had joined a bank and worked in cyber security and now she was selling cyber security uh, software for, uh, for Tesco. Great background to start launching into a sales career, selling cybersecurity solutions. So they felt that Sue had a future, and Sue was so passionate about the company and about the product that she really wanted to stay there and be successful. So this regional vice president walked in and said, we like you, Sue, you've got a future in here. I'm going to be chatting with you and the other salespeople in, in Australia. We all need to rethink the way we sell and we want you to help us go through that rethinking. And we're going to invest in your future. Sue's relief was enormous. Sue worked with this regional vice president who then brought in a mentor, a mentor and coach to coach all the salespeople while they went through the replacement process, process for the Australian sales manager who had been killed in the accident. That process of rethinking the way they sell into what I'm calling disruptive selling or selling via positive disruption was a major turnaround for Sue and for her company in Australia and ultimately for the company globally. It's that story that I want to use as a basis for today's discussion. What did they do? Why did they do it? And how did they get the results that ultimately, uh, right now, three years later, uh, Sue's, Sue, I think this year is going to, they run on a calendar year, I think she's going to hit 300% of quota. Amazing turnaround. She's also seen as a thought leader in both the, the cyber security industry and the customer experience industry. There's a story behind that we're going, to, we're going to find out about during this morning. Disruption occurs when somebody identifies a problem we didn't know we had and provides a solution we didn't know we needed. Has anybody ever done that as a salesperson? A few hands going up. It's, it's amazing experience when it happens, doesn't it? No longer are you there saying, I've got a great product, what's your needs? Okay, I think I can fit the product and the needs and going through a solution selling process. When you go in and you help them disruptively think through a different way of doing business and then help them drive that change, you have no competitors, you're a thought leader to the customer, you build trust, uh, you're a partner, and it doesn't matter what your product is, essentially. And we're going to spend a bit of time talking about that. Sue got the message that it's, it's not what you sell, it's how you sell that matters. Disruptive selling is absolutely essential in my mind to get, is where we need to get our thinking, where we need to get our mindset. Let me put a bit of background to the Tesco. By the way, I've changed Sue's name and the Tesco company name for obvious reasons you'll see as we go through. Um, cloud software uh, based provider, analytics tools, AI to really address cybersecurity. 
they had at that stage brought out a new AI tool that uh, they're coming up a dime a dozen these days, but back in those days it was fairly new in the industry and it would be able to monitor anybody that touched the organisation and look for patterns. So ultimately it was designed to find a pattern in the way a, 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 cook, a, a hacker came into the, into the system. But it was monitoring everybody, customers, so, uh, staff, partners, suppliers, if those suppliers had access to the systems. Um, and, and that was critical to the, the disruptive strategy that we'll talk about in a moment. So how did they go about selling? They approached with a fairly typical USP. Uh, we can do preemptive detection, which is really going to dramatically lower your risk of having an attack by the, the cyber criminals. Uh, if they bought in on that USP, they'd set up a, a standard discovery type meeting and go through and, and do a needs analysis, problems, risks, challenges, uh, and then pro uh, generate a proposal. It's a, it's a fairly typical approach to so solution selling. So when the vice president of sales came in and they, they hired somebody to come in and, and work with them, they, they went back and looked at two things. All the orders they'd won and lost in the last 12 months and analysed either why they won them or why they lost them. And secondly, they looked at the existing pipeline. And one of the questions I looked into was where in the buyer journey did we start having a dialogue with this company? And it turned out that about 70 or 80 per cent of the deals they were working on, they had landed late in that buying journey. And when you're late in a buying journey, you, you, you really be forced down the line of what I call product selling. So in this case, have a look at this buying journey and this typical sales process, uh, solution selling sales process. You can see there, how many are familiar with this? You've been trying to open a door, eventually that door opens and you find out that, yeah, they've been thinking and talking about this change for quite some time. And you really had very little dialogue. You might have tried to get one or two articles in there or whatever, but you haven't had that dialogue, so you have not influenced their thinking. So what do you get? Here's what we need. Here's our specification. Have you got one of these? Happens all the time, doesn't it? Have you got one of these? Have you got a service that does this? Have you got a product that does this? Well, they probably know that you have. They've been done their research and they, that's why they're talking to you. Right? But they've already decided what they want and, and the problem, how they're going to solve the problems they've got with whatever they want. So it's a little bit late to influence their thinking. So first, the biggest issue that, that Tessico had was they were getting into most deals too late and not influencing the thinking. If you look at this sales model, the old product sales model, feature, function, benefit, the orientation of the salesperson tended to be very much about the product. And I've got to say there's still a lot of salespeople and companies that I come across that talk product more than they talk about the customer and what the customer needs are and what the solution is and so on and so forth. I mean, JD's here and he wrote a book on I dare you and the dare you is, which I put to salespeople all the time, I dare you to have in the first meeting with the customer, possibly the second, the third and fourth and fifth meeting with the customer without discussing your company or any of your products. That's selling. Okay, think about it. How often do we have, go into a customer, start talking, ask a couple of questions, the customer says, oh yes, we've got this challenge, we've got, you know, we're trying to address this. Ah, let me tell you about how our product addresses that. First meeting. And suddenly you're a salesperson. Suddenly you're a person that is not going to assist that company think through their challenges and issues. You are slotted into a certain slot, we'll talk to you when we're ready to talk about product. Make sense? Nobody does that here, do they? Okay? So the challenge is always to be moved more and more to the right, and I'm going to show, show you another column here. This is a typical solution selling model. Uh, we're generally oriented around the customer solution. 
uh, we're talking to a coach or advocate in the organisation. Um, the customer typically defines the needs and then we explore those and really get to know them well and then pull together a solution for it. The information flow, the customer typically guides the buying process. Okay, more and more these days. We used to try and guide the buying process in the old days with, when we used to be able to teach customers about products and that was the salesperson's job. That's no longer the salesperson's job. The world has changed. So, and, and the bottom line there is when you're talking product, you're really drawn down to a commoditized environment and it becomes, the discussion becomes price at the end of the day. If the customer is starting to talk price to you and you don't think you're ready, then you've probably been drawn into a product sale model and you need to think about where you are. If you're in solution selling, then you're going through, you've gone through and built a solution, understood their needs very well, built a solution, and you've positioned to differentiate the way your product's going to deliver more value for the customer, and therefore the discussion, discussion is more a value-based discussion than a price-based discussion. Okay, familiar with that? That's solution selling. I'm going to use a lot of quotes today because I think these help us think. William Pollard, one of the pioneers in the world of driving change and managing change. Those who initiate change will have a better opportunity to manage the changes inevitable. Now that applies to our customers and it also applies to you. You need to think about how you initiate change in your world as well as in the customer's world. Disruptive selling helps you do that in the customer world. It's a way of changing yourself so you're focused much more on helping the customer achieve their outcomes. So let's talk about the traditional solution selling model. Now I, I am not here to say solution selling is dead, but the reality is solution selling is a tough sell these days and you're actually not delivering as much value to customers as you possibly could. We all know the world's changing dramatically and the world of sales is changing along with that just as dramatically. So why, why, what's driving that? Well, the market's mature. Now, what does that mean? It means that the way we do business is being more and more commoditized. No matter what the products are, no matter how unique the products are, um, and there's pressure on pricing, there's information parity, our customers have access to to all the information that's available on the internet, including everything about our product and services, right? So our job is not to go and tell the customer about our product and services. They know that. They got access to that. They wouldn't be talking to you if they didn't think at least you get on the dance floor with the right product and service, right? Technology has advanced in all sorts of ways. We, took, we just mentioned artificial intelligence, machine learning and so on, big data, social media, it's changing the way we communicate. It's changing the way we bring value to people. It's changing the conversation in sales. And then finally, probably the most dramatic change is in the way buyers behave. Okay? Because they have all that information, because particularly big corporates, but, but small corporates as well, have really uh, mechanised and, and processed the way they drive change in their organisation, and that includes the procurement process. Okay, so all of these changes are driving a whole lot of commoditization, but the commoditization is driving value out of the relationships if we let it. So let's talk about some of the things we need to do in a moment. First of all, process alignment. CEB talk about the vendor does not get in and have any discussions with the customer until they're 57% down the buying journey. To me, that has destroyed our ability to sell. What is selling? Selling is helping the customer. Where did the word sell come from? Somebody's got the answer. I've told many people this. Anybody help me? Yeah. The old English word salan. Salan meant to give. And that's where the word sell comes from. So if we are going in with the right attitude, we're going into the customer to give, to help, to help them achieve the outcomes they're looking for. 
we are not going in to sell our product. That's an ultimate outcome, but if we go in with that as our mental framework, what's it going to do? One is it's going to change our behaviour. We're not going to be behaving in a way that's congruent to helping the customer, and the customer's going to see that. I will talk to you when I'm ready to buy a product. Okay? So we need to get in early and we need to have conversations. They can be conversations via, uh, via all the different media, and that can be emails, it can be sharing articles, it can be social media, or it can be telephone and face-to-face. -face. And there's a place for all of that. And we need to work on all of that, along with referrals and, and referral selling and managing that as well. All of that to get in early in the buying cycle. When's the best time to get into the buying process? Sorry? Before it, starts. <laughs> before it starts. Absolutely. Basically, the question asked before that I put a couple of hands went up. Yes, I've done that. Okay? Before it starts. Why? Because that's the time you can help the customer. That's the time you can help the customer identify that there's triggers happening in the industry that's, that they're going to be impacted by. And what sort of impacts likely to occur? Let's have a look deep down in your business and understand that impact and then draw, uh, through, draw, draw the customer through to a new way of thinking that can address the impact, you know, disruptively change their thinking so they're better off. Okay, and you can only do that when you're very early in the, in the buying process. So as an organise, it's not just a salesperson issue, this is an organisational issue. Unless you are thinking about as an organisation, how do I establish a sales process that aligns with the buying journey that enables us to really be the organisation that's going to help the customer upset the status quo if necessary, but certainly be there straight after the status quo is upset and they say, ooh, we've got to think about this. Now let's help them with that thinking. So we're going to talk about how we do that. Uh, really that part right at the front of the process there. This is something that Wayne, Mo Wayne Maloney up there behind that camera there has said to me a number of times. He has had customers say this. We have a, all have a sales process. How many have the word discovery in the sales process or something like it? Okay. Right. Discovery is sitting there. And if you go into the customer and say, I'm going to do a discovery, their attitude is, don't waste my time with your discovery, help me with my discovery. And I'll guarantee that's in their brain. They need help to discover where they're at and where they need to go. Job of the salesperson. So let me add disruptive selling to that model there. Type of dialogue. Teaching and challenging. We need to be able to help the customer think through their business challenges, think through how they can change, and we need to do it in a way that changes their thinking quite disruptively. And we'll really define why as we go through this. We need to be the change agent. If you're not helping the customer drive the change in their business, you're a follower. And we've all been followers and not a nice place to be. You're at responding to RFPs, you're, you're getting in there and they're outlining the specification, they're telling you what they want and you're trying to respond to it rather than take the lead and show them how they really can change their business for the better in a very disruptive, positive way. The customer interface is, we're the strategic change leader. Who's that in most organisations? CEO, and I'll give you some research in a moment that tells you it is the CEO. If you're not selling, if you have something that can change the way a company does business and you're trying to sell it, if you're not talking to the CEO, you're missing the mark. All the research is showing that. The customers are telling us that. 
The dialogue starts when the customer is learning very early in the process. The information flow, we're aligning what we're doing to the buying process. We're helping them through their buying process right from the beginning. And the value focus is game change of value. We're helping them disruptively rethink the way they're doing business and it's changing their game and the value now, the price becomes almost irrelevant. In fact, I've seen a few uh, in the last six months, customers I've been working with, vendors, who've got orders that the customer even didn't even know what the price was practically. They, they, how much, oh, okay, and they signed it because they just understood the value of the change. I'm, I'm not going to say don't do solution selling. There is a place for solution selling, but I would like you to get in a mindset that wherever possible, you move right to this paradigm of disruptive selling. Most of us know Tony Hughes, and, and a lot of you will have seen this chart Tony talks to. He talks about the future of sales as strategic, where we need salespeople. Where we need salespeople. Buyers now can buy commodities without talking to salespeople. Now, of course, this started in the B2C world, buying cars or whatever, uh, and we're all now quite familiar. If you go back 20 years ago, would you have conceived of the fact you'd buy a car without going into a, uh, into a, um, a dealership and, and you know, testing the car and being sold to by the sales guy and so on? How many, how many bought their last car without the involvement of a dealer? Of course, we all know that, uh, the experience of some of the disruptive companies, like Tesla. Elon Musk got up there, how long ago was it now? 18, 12, month, 12 months, 18 months, or whatever it was. And in one weekend, sold $10 billion worth of cars online. Right? The world has changed. So when you think about the transactional sales side of what a lot of people do, there is no future in it. If all you're doing is being a person that goes and talks about, uh, here's my product, what are your needs, okay, let's do the transaction, this is the price, blah, blah, blah. There's no, no future whatsoever. You are not creating the value. Tony talks about, are you creating the value that funds your role? Okay, think about it. And the value you're creating has to be value in the eyes of the customer. If you're not creating value in the eyes of the customer, you're not creating enough value to fund your role. The argument Tony puts up is the tactical hunter-warrior salesperson and the relationship salesperson are, becoming, are moving in the same direction. They're not creating the value that funds their role. We all have to become much more strategic. We all have to, be, have to learn how to have that value-based peer-to-peer conversation with a CEO or at least a C-suite or senior executives. If you can't learn how to have that conversation, in the future you probably won't create the value that funds your role. Okay. So, how do we be strategic? You can all read up there. That's what Tony presents. I want to break and, and let you have a discussion for a second, just to get your minds going. And I'd, I'd like most of you to focus on this first question. Um, and that is, how can we get out of our own world of products and services and, and how we can sell and manage our pipeline and all that sort of stuff, and get do more thinking in the customer world? It's about getting our frame of mind right to create value that funds our role. Let's just take two or three minutes to do that. So, any uh, gems come out on that first question on your table? Really what, what we're talking about to start with is do your research before you go and see someone. You know, do your research, get some information, dig deep. Don't just say, oh, look at their marketing brochure. You know, really get into the um, people within organisations. I find LinkedIn very useful for that to see where they've been previously. So okay. particularly if you're talking to cu uh, customers that are on the stock market, typically the C-level people are out presenting to the investor community anyway. So they're kind of 
uh, sharing their problems, sharing their future, sharing the direction, right? So that's, in terms of trying to understand what you're selling to, they're, they're already telling the market what, what problems they're trying to solve. So in terms of research, that would help understand the customer well better. If I were a shareholder, what would I expect that company to be doing? And to listen to the CEO about that company, and uh, John made that point here. The other thing I wanted to ask, actually, if I may, um, which is to do with this, and I asked it at the table as well, is are organisations willing to spend the time and money to train their staff to actually go through that process? Or do they expect ready-made men? Great question. Uh, and, and I will talk about that later, but the, it's really important. The change that we're talking about to disrupt these sales is something very hard for an individual salesperson to do without the organisation thinking about how it happens at an organisational level. And it's not just training, David. It's, it's, it's really rethinking the way as an organisation we sell. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about what Sue did. Uh, and I'm talking about Sue. Sue, to me, I, I wouldn't expect the average salesperson to achieve what Sue's achieved. It's been outstanding. But what Sue did is, first of all, the, the mentor that came in to talk to her said, well, do you see yourself as a domain expert? And Sue said, yeah, I'm a domain expert in cybersecurity. Okay, is that what the customer wants to talk about? Well, yeah, they, they're worried about their security and so on. So he, uh, he, he, well, they talked about a few things that you needed to build domain expertise in. It wasn't so much cyber security. It was about banking and the importance of a whole, as, whole lot of aspects in banking. And we'll talk about more about that in a moment. Uh, but also customer experience came into it. She had to become an expert in customer security. Now, everybody's saying, well, what's, what's cyber security got to do with customer experience? I'll explain that in a moment. But they decided that she had to build domain expertise in those two areas, customer, uh, customer experience and, and the way they thought about security in the bank and the security of data and so on. It wasn't just the nuts and bolts of cyber security. Uh, Sue uh, did a whole host of things. First of all, her mentor said, go and find all the experts worldwide in both those categories and connect with them. They're all on LinkedIn. They all write articles, read their articles, understand why and connect and have you know, Skype discussions with them or whatever, Sue just went out of her way. She connected with about 60 or 70 experts in customer experience and cyber security and called them and had discussions with them and every single one of them were quite happy to take a call, right? And she just learnt so much from that. She then identified all in this region, she was going to Singapore and all over the place, companies supported her, right? She went to all the conferences and now she was selling to the banking industry, so she went to banking conferences. She went to cyber security conferences where the banks were attending. She was listening to what they were all talking about. Then she went to customer experience conferences where the banks were attending. And she really got to, and by the way, she met a brilliant network of middle level type management people at those, at those conferences. But the things she learned, and then she started writing articles herself. And within a very short, and I'm talking about nine month cycle, she became seen herself as a domain expert. She was being asked to speak at conferences herself. She was asked you know, to, to share her papers and her thinking with all sorts of people. She went from, you know, I'd studied cyber security at university and I, I worked in a bank for a couple of years in cyber security, I, I sort of, I'm a cyber security expert, to now being a domain expert across cyber security and customer experience in nine months. And she was able to open the doors into, into one of the four big bank CEO, uh, but into a whole host of senior executives across the banking industry. That's how she got her thinking into the customer world. And none of that was about her product, right? None of that was about her product. And all the discussions she had and the papers she wrote and everything, nothing about her product, nothing about you know, you know, the, the, the brand of, or the, the label of, of cyber security. It was all about you know, how banks are approaching risk and some of the things happening internationally and you know, ha how they went about addressing the issues. No discussion about her company, her product at all and any of that. And every meeting she had, she had the dialogue along those lines. She didn't talk about her product. And yet she's now probably over 300, I think she was closing an order last week, over 300% of quota. 
this year. But a lot of people say, Sue doesn't sell anymore. She consults. She disrupts the thinking of her target audience and builds an enormous amount of trust in the way she does it. The arrogance of success is to think what we did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. So I'm telling you, you've got to go and knock on the door of a CEO and I've got to tell you, you're going to have to go and disrupt their thinking. That's pretty arrogant of me, is it? Do CEOs recognise that issue? That's right, Steve. If they don't, they won't be a CEO for very long. Do they want their thinking disrupted? I'm going to knock on your door, Mr CEO, and I'm coming in to disrupt your thinking. Do they want to be disrupted? More than they want to be discovered. Only for their own benefit. Depends on the size of the company. Let me show you some research. Uh, 2017, 2018, the KPMG Forbes CEO Insights. Anybody read this? Two out of three CEOs say that uh, they see disruption as an opportunity. Nearly three quarters say they are doing everything in their power to actively disrupt their sector. A couple of other interesting things in the last survey. Agility and speed is a, what's the other words, the currency of business today. And that's the agility and speed of driving disruptive change in their company and to their market. CEOs, <laughs> this is a really interesting one. CEOs favour intuition over data-driven insights. Wow. Here we are with all the data, data analytic tools and all this stuff going out there and the CEOs still rely more on their intu intuition. Now, that's just a side, but I thought that was really interesting. If you, can, if you can help the CEO help support their intuition, you're probably in a, in a pretty good position. The one right down the bottom I found very interesting. So, all these CEOs, are, or two, three quarters of them, are trying to drive disruption in their company and their industry, and yet they're all saying that a much slower percentage of their leadership teams have the right mindset to drive in a disruptive model. So they need help. Interesting research. Actually, good CEOs actively go out of their way to have their thinking disrupted. Do they expect it from a salesperson? No. Will they receive it from a salesperson? They'll receive it from anywhere. They are thirsty for it. Okay? First disrupt my business, help me disrupt my business so then I can disrupt my market. They all recognise that they can't disrupt their market at all until they disrupt the way they do business. So where are buyers at? Hey, this is something I just inserted because this is research. How many, how many have seen this research paper? It was published last week. Mood of the B2B buyer, Trinity Perspectives. Great bit of research. I just pulled a few bits out of it, but by the way, whenever you see something underlined here, it's a link in the slides and you will get a copy of the slides, but you'll be able to click on any link in these slides and be able to access whatever's here. This is what I learned out of this survey. 76% of business procurements are triggered by a, a disruption. This is what the customers are telling us. Are triggered by a disruption in their business. A competitive disruption, a customer-led disruption, a market disruption, or some strategic change that's disrupted the, the, the organisation. So, there's the word trigger. Really important to you, to, for you to be on top of all the triggers for change that's happening in your customer's environment. And then customer's environment means the marketplace they're operating in, means their customer base, means all their competitors, it means 
a whole host of different things. You just need to be across where all those triggers are and be monitoring them. C-suite influence, um, the customers themselves said the person that has the most influence on all those decisions was the CEO. Okay. We must be calling or influencing the CEO. And finally, Trinity Perspective said at the bottom line, can you list your four or five key buying criteria on the last one or two deals you did? Now, a bit of a dichotomy here. 85% invited vendors late and, and don't see a need to invite vendors early, and yet a large proportion said they evaluate the vendor on their ability to disrupt our thinking. Does that make sense? It's the vendors that are getting in and working with the customer to help disrupt the thinking that are winning most of that business. Okay? And the customers probably don't even see them as vendors. They see them as business partners, trusted partners that are helping them change their business. Okay? Kean McLaughlin's the CEO of the organisation that did this research and Kean's company does win-loss reviews. Big deals typically, but middle-sized deals as well, B2B deals. And these are the sorts of things that customers tell Kean. But the world's changing, the customers are telling us the sales organisations are not changing with it, are not going to succeed. Bottom line, it's all about EQ, not IQ. Why they chose the supplier? These are three key points, but that top one is the one that jumps out at me. Consistent message that Kean is getting in all the win-loss reviews they do. Okay? Good message there. So the bottom line, C-suite buyers want to think differently about their business. They want new insight. They want applied thinking. They want to explore ways to achieve their desired outcomes, new and different ways. They know that they need to be fast and agile and driving change in their organisation. They need to understand what they cha those changes are and how they can go forward. Laggards follow the path of familiarity. Challenges follow the path of the greatest opportunity where it leads. So, how do we disrupt? This is a simple view of how we actually put that in place. Sue did it in her company extremely well, but the company supported her. So the question you raised, David, is really important. This is how you disrupt, but if you don't put the framework and the support structure uh, and the encouragement together for the sales force to do this, they'll continue to be product or at best solution salespeople struggling against all the other competitors. Getting attention, I'm not going to spend any time on and you know, down to the compelling event and the, and the value proposition, I'm not going to put time on. The real thing is what I call down the hole and up the hill. This is once you're in front of the customer and you're doing your discovery, a disruptive discovery, we need to focus very heavily on how we do that. It needs to be systemised. And it's all about questions and it's all about stories. How many attended the last forum with Mike Adams talking about storytelling in sales? Wasn't it brilliant? Okay, so those that have been here at that and those that haven't, there's a great the video of that is, is available on the Sales Masterminds website. But the storytelling is even more powerful than questions. Okay, done properly. And he talks about the seven, seven uh, stories every salesperson must tell. And he aligns those stories to the sales or the buying journey. The sort of stories you tell early in the buying journey, later in the buying journey, and later in the buying journey. Really powerful stuff. So you need to apply that. There are stories you need to have going down the hole and stories you need going up the hill. Down the hole, the concept here is you can never take anybody on a thinking journey to a new awakening unless you really understand grassroots what's it all about. You, you'll end up going on a path that doesn't make sense for them or that they can't make sense of. 
So you need to get down and dirty in the hole, a deep, deep dive into their business. Right? And, and, and get your product and services out of your mind when you do this. It's a deep dive to understand at least one part of their business, if not their whole business. And then once you've done that, and only once you've done that, in, 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 in larger B2B deals, that can take 10 meetings with five different people. How many have done more than that? I've done more than that. Well, the really big deals can go for 18 months, right? Doing a discovery without talking about your product. <laughs> okay, and then up the hill. This is a real skill we all need to learn. How do we take the thinking of a customer through a journey to a new awaiting? Ah, that's what you mean, right? I can see that happening in our organisation. Of course, the next you go into, well, what, what would be the value of that? Let's really nail that down. And anybody uh, hasn't seen it, there's a video discussion I did with Dean Kelly where he talks about sales poker. This is the same mindset issue. We all want to, once we've talked about what the challenges are and we say, here's how our product will address that challenges, and by the way, here's what I think the value is for you, Mr. Customer. Our mindset's wrong. The value must be expressed by the customer first. So Dean uses the poker analogy. Make sure the buyer puts the value chips on the table before you do. Okay? Now that's all I'm going to talk about in the last item. I want to talk more about how we build our sales disruptive strategy so we can do what we've just talked about there. First of all, we need to really have a deep understanding of what the stakeholders care about. We talked about what Sue did to achieve that. This is a stakeholder care map that a CRM provider use, just to give you an idea of the sort of thing that you can apply. And so here's what the CEO cares about. Look down all the cares and you see the cares are so different, aren't they? So if you're doing all your selling down at those last three areas there, not getting anywhere near what the CEO is thinking about and cares about. This is what Sue and Tessico identified with the help of a big research organisation. This is three years ago now, probably a little bit different following the uh, Royal Commission. These are what they identified as the top five, top of mind issues that they care about. So the mentor that was taking Sue and a company through this thinking uh, said, all right, let's, let's explore each one of these. Yes, you've always done what you've done in the, in the orange there. But they identified with a lot of discussion, a lot of research and thinking about what Tessico were doing with customers internationally, that they could actually address the customer experience area. Why? Well, their software was monitoring all people that were touching their systems, right, to look for the bad guys. But they were looking at all the patterns, and that was what the artificial intelligence, intelligence was all about, the patterns of the people going through the systems and using the systems. And therefore, they could look at the patterns of what the customers were doing coming to the systems and what the partners were doing and what the staff were doing. And when they did that, they found out there was all sorts of quagmire in the way people used the systems that they could rethink and deliver so much better experience for all their customers out of a cybersecurity system. So were they selling a cybersecurity solution? Well, ultimately, it's come down to the fact that cybersecurity is one of the side benefits of implementing what they do. So they changed their thinking and really went uh, and looked at an, uh, a different model altogether to do that. We talked about triggers, so we really need to think ahead of time what triggers are likely to occur in the customer's industry and the customer's specific account. I mean, anybody from anything from CEOs being replaced and you know, all sorts of triggers happening in the financial industry right now, right? And how can they counter? whatever impact that trigger is going to come. Well, how can the customer counter that? How, what are the different options? And have that thinking before then we say, what could we do? And then what content do we need? And I'm talking, I'm not, 
I, I just so often see people, okay, let's get the marketing guys, we've got the triggers, let's start writing the content and the content comes out. You know, you, you, this is a problem that you're going to face, that the world is changing in your area and here's how we can help you. We've got this product, bang, 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 bang. That's the content that comes out. Not helpful at all. It's, we've got to put our, our mind in the, in the mind of the customer and the content's got to be how do they think through the change that's occurring and rethink the way they're going to do business in a new and different way that's valuable to them. It, it's not about a product or a service. It's only when you've got them through that thinking journey are you able to start saying, well, okay, we can help you now achieve this. Part of the solution will be ours. I guarantee it never is all of it, right? Part of the solution is yours. But that's way down the, the sales track. Approach narratives. Steve Hall spoke last year at this forum about how to sell to the C-suite. And a big part of that was how to build a narrative. And he keeps it so simple. We would like to talk to you about what you care about. There's another video available on the, on the forum. Let me, let me just run through this with something that Sue and her team did. They identified that right down the bottom here, they see the word liability, and they identified that the personal liability of a CEO in this day and age is top of mind of most CEOs. They can go to jail. They can go to jail if a hacker hacks in and gets their customer details. That's a jailable offence to the CEO. Did you know that? So guess what the, the CEO's thinking about? So based on that, Sue put a, a, a little strategy together which worked, a wonder, worked wonders in one bank uh, where she identified what do they care about? Not going to jail. What triggers could upset that? Well, they'll start thinking about it a lot when if some, other, some bank internationally is hit by a, a hacker or an Australian bank, okay? And that's going to happen, right? We know that's going to happen. So be ready. What, how do we respond when that happens? How do we counter? What content do we need? What we need to write articles about the risks to CEOs of, and how they, you know, they need to think about it and, and be ready for it and so on and so forth. The narrative, simple. Pick up the phone and call the CEO and say, I want to come and talk to you about how to keep you out of jail. Are they going to listen to that? Obviously, it's not as simple as that, but it's Try and keep it simple. It's not anything about your product. It's not anything about anything to do with anything we think of. It's to do with the customer. And finally, once you've done that, think about the thinking journey. Sue actually got to a CEO of a mid-sized bank with that approach and that strategy. Made it all about the CEO and what they cared about. Staying out of jail. It wasn't actually that, but it was, you know, minimise your personal liabilities. This is what Tessico basically did. I've, I've told you a lot about what Sue did in, in building the disruptive sales strategy. They did some retraining. David uh, mentioned that. And the retraining was not about product or service, not even a lot about sales. It was learning to think and talk and behave and converse peer-to-peer -peer with a banking CEO. Okay. Oh, I mentioned Sue built a, a, a brilliant, but I'm a great believer in personal brands in this day and age. As salespeople, we need to write articles. We need to be seen, whether they go to LinkedIn or the company blog or whatever. There's an article from John Smybert there talking about what they care about. Ooh, maybe I should talk to this. I know, I know they're a salesperson, but... They seem to be an expert on this. Maybe I should have a chat with them. Okay. We all need to build. And as those that are sales leaders and CEOs, and there's a few in the room, I really implore you to encourage your sales teams to build customer-focused personal brands. Okay. Your company will leverage it. They need, obviously, to be aligned to your company, but it needs to be their personal brand that shows their domain expertise and it's somebody that the customer would want to talk with. Let's have a brief discussion. Think about a scenario of your customers. In your handouts there is a, is a little model to use. 
which is basically that this here. Quickly just think what the customer cares about, what the triggers would be, right, how, how they might counter that, and then ultimately down to what would be the thinking journey you'd need to take them through. Okay, anybody got anything they want to... Got one? Um, what I was saying to the guys, interestingly enough, I've been working with an InsureTech um, startup, and I don't know if you know, out of all the industries out there, insurance is the one that needs the most disruption, but is so behind the times, beige, boring, doesn't want to do it. So this approach is definitely an approach that would work in that scenario, because you can't go into an insurance company as a small insure tech business and say, hey, we want to talk to you about our new solution, our new product. You have to take it from a different way. You know, we've done Miller Hyman, we've done Challenger, and you spend millions of millions of dollars on this stuff, and you send your sales teams off for 10 days, they all come back, they're going to change the world. And then it doesn't become part of everyday language from the top down. And that's another challenge. I was telling the guys when I worked for a software company, I won't see who it was, they, uh, everybody had to do 15 calls a day and that wasn't working. So the powers that be decided, you know what, we're going to fix this. You make 30 calls a day because that's going to solve your problem. You know, I typify a sales guy being a very bold, upfront, pushy type of person. But it sounds like the successful salesperson in the future could be a very much a different type of character and being much more an empathetic, quite in, uh, intuitive, and actually a very strong researcher in understanding their customers. So it's actually, I think the nature of the salesperson is going to change. Great comment. Kean McLaughlin actually, with all the research he's done on the win-loss, uh, says the best salespeople are the humble ones. The best salespeople are the ones that are slightly introverted. Why? They're the ones, and we'll look at some skills in a moment, they're the ones that really are great listeners, great conversationalists. Obviously you don't need somebody so shy they can't talk, but you need to have salespeople that are there with the customer, you know, right in the conversation, and can have that peer-to-peer -peer conversation and know how to ask the questions. So let me go on. There's some research done by these guys here that was eight years of research and their focus was on how to get disruptive innovation occurring in organisations. And the great learnings, uh, again, the link is to an article on this uh, and you can go and look at the research if you want. A few things they learnt. Five skills they identified that disruptive innovators need to have. Now for those sales managers out there, You've probably got the fifth on the list already, but the first four should be on your skills inventory when you're hiring salespeople. For the salespeople you've already got and, and those salespeople in the room, you need to think about how do I build these skills. Right? Now, today is not about those skills, and you can go and look at the research and delve into it more. Today's about uh, skill number five, questioning. And I really want to finish today talking about that. A couple of observations that they made. It's the people that ask provocative questions, the people that, that don't give in. They keep asking why. That's why I've got that child there. What do they do? They keep asking why. And then we, we forget how to do it. Okay? And they push boundaries, assumptions, and borders. They leave few rocks unturned. Okay, they identified through all this research a pattern which is really what I call down the hole and up the hill pattern. Uh, and they identified four tactics. So the, the, they called down the hill what currently is. And then they called up the hill what might be. And then they identified four tactics, two for what, to identify what currently is and two up the hill. Pretty simple, but it's hard to do. I have been coaching and training and cajoling and, and so on salespeople for years and I'll go in and I'll run a training course so it teaches people how to do some of this sort of stuff. And then we'll run reinforcement sessions over, the, uh, over a period of eight or nine months. And then I'll go out on a call with one of these salespersons and the customer will say, oh yeah, we've got this challenge. They'll say, oh, let me tell you about how our product addresses that. And he's just killed the opportunity to do this and become a thought leader with the customer, to, bring the, to build trust with the customer as a potential you know, partner that can work with them and help them work through their business challenges. I'm now a product sales guy. Let me tell me how my product will do that. 
biggest issue every salesperson has. And we must, if we're going to drive professionalism in the sales industry, which is my passion, we've got to get them to stop doing that. Salespeople do not talk about product until the right time. Take people through a thinking journey and that thinking journey will be to a, a scenario that your product will help deliver. But in taking them through the thinking journey, don't discuss your product. Don't tell them anything about your product. That's not the job of a salesperson. As I said, do not in the first, second, depending on what you're selling, the third meeting you have with a customer, do not discuss your product. What are the customer buying? They're buying you, not your product. So you need to be the domain expert. You need to the pe be the person with the expertise to ask the questions to take them uh, down a path to a new awakening that will help their business. Tony Robbins, all that said, right, in that statement. The customer is going to buy you, not your product. Once they bought you, they'll then buy your product, but that won't even be a sale. The sale is selling yourself. And you do that by helping them disrupt their thinking in a very constructive and positive way. Tesco, they ended up getting going in Australia and rolling out through Asia Pacific, and they've had amazing results and just kicking goals left, right and centre. It's all disruptive selling, but they've done it, systemised it, made sure those patterns of questioning and everybody understands and they made all their salespeople consultants and trained them how to do this. Not just train them, they've become part of the culture and this is a cultural change. It's a change program you need to go through. Everything I've referred to and, and sourced information from uh, will be on this list of references and content. Uh, the research programs uh, that I've talked about, and then there's a number of videos, and I've, I've run out of room, there's a whole host of videos. And the last item there um, is on the Sales Leadership Forum. Um, there's a channel for this forum on uh, YouTube, and everything we do and all the interviews we do is on that forum available to you, so make sure you go there. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that was of value to you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some time for questions. Oh, Andrew, how are you? Uh, that, was, that was great. Thanks for that. I'm um, just wondering how you, you talked about at the end how you got it into um, the actual si uh, the cycle in, into the actual sales team. Can you describe more about the process of how you get it in day to day into Teslico, the, the, um, the partner you spoke about? The, so the, which you, uh, the, the um, case study that you went through um, yeah. right throughout the cybersecurity company, how you've got disruptive selling into the the um, hard into all the sales agents there. Uh, okay, it's, I, I refer to Sue a lot. Uh, and, and you need champions. You need champions in management and you need champions in the field. And Sue was one of the best champions I've ever seen. So they went through this model that we talked about. They went through that uh, with, with those five key areas that the banks were interested in and then worked out what their disruptive processes were going to be, right down to the thinking journeys they had to take them through. Sue was the one that really drove a lot of this. Uh, she's ended up being the change agent in Tessico. Um, the, guy, the, the director that I talked about that came from Singapore was trying to drive it through Asia, and, and Sue just took up the mantle and he's used her uh, he flies her in and out of Singapore and all over the place. You need to find those champions. You need to follow a process like this. Uh, and then everything else that goes with it. The content. How many people from marketing here? No one. Good. <laughs> marketing content stinks. Now, that's being unfair. Good marketers will write great content that's really valuable for the customer that does not discuss your product. That's the content I'm talking about. In my mind, we need salespeople to develop content too. You're, all salespeople have some level of expertise. They're working with customers all the time. They see the changes happening in the customer environment. They can write about it. And that's valuable for another customer. 
Obviously, they don't necessarily not use the customer name and so on and so forth, but they, talk, they can tell the story. That's highly valuable. So, you know, content, all of that sort of stuff. Does that answer your question? And, and let's not forget, you'll get access to all of this material, so you'll be able to refer back to that and take your time. There is so much stuff here. Does anyone else have a, another question for John? Just a quick question, John. Um, it seems to me this is upside down to the um, inexperienced SDR gets meetings for the experienced account manager model. What do you have to say about that? A friend of ours has turned that upside down, hasn't he, with uh, John Bedwani. Um, I, I agree. Uh, the most experienced guy you need is probably an SDR. They need to have the conversation with the CEO on the telephone. How many C SDRs have you seen that can do that? I find it amazing. We're going to start the whole sales process. We're going to start the, the, the collaboration or conversation with a customer with the most junior person in the sales team. Absolutely ridiculous. I mentioned John Bedwani and, and I've done some interviews with John. He has turned that up. So he hires this guys my age who've been selling to CEOs their whole life and he puts them on the telephone as a retirement job. And, and these guys can talk the business. They can talk, they can converse and so on. Uh, and he actually builds big corporate relationships for companies like IBM. I mean, he works the Westpac relationship for IBM on behalf of IBM using SDRs. A different model altogether. So great question. Um, Len, in, in, one of the, in, in one of the discussions, said to me, yeah, but the average sales tenure is you know, 15 to 18 months in, in the B2B world. I find that devastating. And I can tell you that the issue is not the salespeople turning over. The issue is the, co the uh, company not doing what we're talking about here now, developing their capabilities, helping bring... You know, if that sales director came in from Singapore and said to Sue, you haven't got your numbers for 18 months, Unless you've turned that around in the next six months, you're out. Right? Would have destroyed the whole strategy. And you know, Tessico would have, you know, with that sort of attitude, just would have wandered on and sales people turned over and they wouldn't have got, been getting the numbers they're getting now.